Welcome to worship this evening, Sundays at 6, or whenever it is that you are watching. Whenever it is that you are worshiping, and wherever it is, coming to you from my porch swing here in downtown Wilmington, and I hope that you will take the time to make a sacred, holy space wherever it is that you are right now. I invite you to light a candle, to reach out to someone and wish them the peace of Christ. Maybe that's via text, maybe you can send them a picture with peace, um, maybe it's just sending an email. We continue to lament that we are not able to be together, and yet we are grateful that wherever two or three are gathered, whether or not it is on YouTube or Facebook or wherever, that God is here with us. And so now I invite you to join us in our opening prayer. Ever-present God, you never leave us, no matter what happens. No matter what we do or where we are, you are always waiting for us. Shine the light of your steadfast love on us as gather. Help us to understand and hear your word so that we can love you with all our hearts and minds and selves. Through your Holy Spirit, Give us courage to live differently and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. reading tonight comes from Exodus 32, 1 through 14. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we do not know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards, they sat down to eat 
and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people who you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them, and they have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked. Now leave me alone, so that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people, whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out, to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring, bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be yours, it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. I remember being in college and watching American Idol for the first time when it came out. I remember even getting a ticket to go sit in arena, in an arena, and watch Clay Aiken and Ruben Starker and all of the famous people from American Idol season two. That's not what we're talking about when we say idols, of course. As Bonnie read so beautifully earlier, Moses had not even come down the mountain with the Ten Commandments. They had melted down under the leadership of Aaron, their earrings and all of their things. And, but it wasn't to make what God had described to them, the furnishings of the tabernacle. It was to make a lower, lowercase g God. Bonnie asked me this week, an excellent question <laughs> in one of the verses when it said when it refers to the Lord 
she says, are they talking about the golden calf or are they talking about God? And I said, that's an excellent question. Because we normally think of idols as something we can't possibly mistake for God. Something that is foreign, something that is profane. We usually don't think of an idol as something that we could mistake for the holy. And yet, that is what the Israelites do. They are having a religious festival. <laughs> they tell Aaron to make them a god, and then they want to honor this being that has brought them out of the land of Egypt. It's kind of a laudable impulse, right? <laughs> Aaron says, here, these are your gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt because the people want to worship. <laughs> we want to worship things and people. Sometimes our human hearts are maybe if not always idol factories, they're always worship factories. We always want to revere someone or something, maybe this intangible thing that brings us this idea of the holy, that we want to give something or someone credit. I wonder instead of golden calves, if maybe some of our idols are things that we have never thought as such. <laughs> maybe it's the status quo. Maybe it's a political affiliation. Maybe it's our systems that we are used to. Maybe even the love of our country or our team or our town. Not that any of these things are wrong in and of themselves. Any more than maybe making a gold cow <laughs> to display and just have a decoration is wrong. Something happens when we give the glory, the honor, the reverence that only belongs to God, when we give it to something else. My shirt is from a quote that I am dwelling with in this season. I've shared it here at Sundays and Six, I think a couple times. It doesn't have to be this way. The sentence by Andre Henry, a black Christian writer and thinker and musician. I have been thinking about what are the it's that don't have to be that way. The things that seem so natural, so written into the fabric of our lives and our world that maybe we are giving reverence to that if we looked at with different eyes, we might say, this, I wonder sometimes we can take traditions, things of the past that are good, but that we can almost worship them. I can't imagine that, that the Israelites had seen this way of worshiping before. <laughs> they had seen the other peoples, all the other peoples of the world create these statues create this form of worship and yet God was calling them to something new. Maybe God is calling us as well. What sort of thing, whether it is a good thing like love of our country, might God be calling us to look at and say, am I holding this above God himself? What sort of rights or freedoms do we have that we are using not to serve God and others, but maybe to serve ourselves? What is the it that is not quite right in your life, in your heart, in your soul, that doesn't have to be this way? I think as we inch towards knock on wood and I am praying in-person outdoor worship soon, I think about the uncertainty that we have been living in for the past six months. 
that we continue to live in, honestly, as there are continued um, protests over racial injustice, as we continue to battle coronavirus, as schools open or virtually or in person. I was talking to a friend and she said, anybody who can make a definitive announcement about something more than two weeks in the future is lying to you. Felt like a punch in the gut and yet I knew she was right. <laughs> I think that certainty, maybe even advanced planning as good as that can be sometimes, is perhaps one of those idols. We have always known what the fall is going to look like, what Christmas is going to look like, what the holidays of church is going to look like. We're so grateful to have Annie sharing her testimony. She shared it this morning in the Sunday morning worship. And we are grateful to have her sharing this evening as well. She talks a little bit about being certain about what a call looks like. Maybe about some folks' certainty about the church or certainty that the church is not for them. Maybe for me, certainty and absolute knowing is one of those idols that I have to lay down. I have to let God destroy. Yet, Lord, you are larger. You are the only one to be worshipped. Where do you start when saying goodbye to the people who have loved and raised you for 25 years? Maybe you start with thank you, or maybe you don't start at all and you put off writing your testimony until the very last day that it's acceptable for you to turn it in. Sorry to Ryan and all the other tech support people who have to put up with me. If you don't know me, my name is Annie Jewell, and I was born and raised in Wrightsville United Methodist. My parents are the music leaders here, and over the years I've gone from a singer in the choir to a section leader to the music director of our weekly evening service, Sundays at 6, which, by the way, is a very cool service, and you should check it out if you can. Today, though, I'm not coming to you in any official capacity. I'm coming to you as a church member, as a child of WUMC, and as a child of God. Over the last 48 hours, I have packed up all my earthly belongings and moved to St. Andrews, Scotland, where I'll be earning my master's degree this year in sacred music. Um, while I am thrilled about this opportunity, I would be absolutely remiss if I didn't acknowledge the massive role that our church has played in my life and in my career path. When I say our church, I mean every facet of our church. I mean the staff that I've gotten to work with. I mean the constant members like Don and Lois Steele and Phyllis Millard and Carol and P.D. Midget and all the others who have practically raised me. And I mean the church itself, the church with a capital C and like the registered trademark symbol next to it. When I think of the church, TM, I think of the wonderful organizations like the Methodist Home for Children, like UMCOR, and like Mission of Hope in Rotafunk Sierra Leone. I think of the wonderful groups that I've had the privilege of working with and watching aid the world of watching our church be the hands and feet of Christ. In applying for graduate schools though, and in looking at pursuing a whole life of church work, I realized that everyone doesn't have the same blessed experience with the church. I realize that many of my peers shy away from all organized religion, and they view Christianity as a selfish and bigoted religion that's responsible for 2,000 years of persecution and evil. Did you know that over one third of millennials aren't religious at all? And that number is even higher in Gen Z. Something more interesting than that to me though is that spirituality is very common amongst people in my age group. They believe that human life is sacred and in the importance of equality and justice and that the earth is valuable and beautiful and we need to protect it, they just don't believe in the church. And that's got me thinking, isn't that what the church is all about? Isn't that what we're doing? Aren't we working towards building hospitals and rotifunk to preserve human life? And aren't we giving food and shelter to those who need it? What more could we possibly do as the church? There's a disconnect between the way the world views the church and the church that I know and love. We're all working towards the same things for the most part, but most people haven't had the privilege and the honor of knowing the good people of Wrightsville United Methodist. 
and going to a different country and in pursuing church music, I hope that I can be an advocate for our church and for every wonderful church that puts so much time and so many resources into aiding our communities. It's hard to describe what a calling feels like to someone who has never felt one. I've spent my entire life listening to people give testimonies about feeling a calling to devote their life to God. And I've always thought like, oh cool, great, give your life to God and be a preacher or whatever that is so good for you. But it wasn't until I felt my own calling about six months ago that I could ever truly relate. Sitting over dinner one night, I had the thought, Every day for the rest of my life, I want to wake up in the morning and serve God. I want to be a beacon of light for every single person I meet. I want to be a source of good. I want to inspire others to be good as well. I want to be an ordained minister of music and work in the church forever. What? No. Nope. Thanks, God, but no thanks. I have a life. I work with wonderful kids all day, teaching them music. It's fulfilling. I am making a difference in the world. I am good. But the thought wouldn't stop nagging at my brain. While teaching a violin lesson, it would pop into my head, hey, you could be leading people to God right now. Or I would be just a very distracted driver sometimes. Hey, what if you gave up your entire life and learned about the gospel? And then you can just teach people that forever through music. You love music. What could go wrong? God has an annoying habit of being right and also of patiently waiting for you to make your own decisions. One day I had the life-changing thought to look up graduate schools. The top result on the list of best sacred music schools in the entire world was the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. I looked at the school's webpage and I applied at once. And then I took a nap and I watched an episode of The Good Place and I forgot all about it. It was a prestigious school in the Scottish Highlands that the royal family went there and it's over 600 years old and they do not want some hick musician from North Carolina. Well, a few months later, all was forgotten and I got an acceptance letter while eating my Cheerios one morning. The rest is history. Making the decision to give up everything is not easy. Making the decision to leave behind your grandparents and family and job and beautiful home is not easy, especially not in the middle of a global pandemic that's wreaking havoc on the world. I was feeling just an awful combination of extreme guilt and despair and general nausea when my mom, who is a million times smarter than me and lives on a farm, reminded me of the story of Lucky the Duck. When I was a kid, we had a bunch of ducks on the farm. Ducks aren't the smartest of God's glorious creatures. Um, and to me, our flock seemed particularly dumb. But one day, all the ducks were standing around in the pasture, and Lucky got just a look of extreme concentration and focus on his face. And he thought for a minute, and then took off running. And after clearing half the field, he rose up into the air and flew. And he flew some circles around the field, and then came back down and was forevermore a changed duck. All of our other ducks watched him in awe and in jealousy, why couldn't they fly too? Lucky was crazy for even attempting it. Everyone else just had to live their whole lives on the ground and it wasn't fair. The only difference, of course, between Lucky and those other ducks was that he tried it. They all had the ability to fly, but Lucky was the only one crazy enough to try it. Of course, my mom knew the metaphor when she was telling me, and I appreciate it. We can all fly. We can all be a source of good and we can all follow a calling. No matter how stubborn we are, no matter how much we want to ignore God's gentle, or at times not so gentle, nudging, he knows that we can fly. I'm forever thankful that Riceville United Methodist has helped show me my wings, and I'm thankful that God has given me the opportunity to use them. Just like Lucky, though, I will fly back home, hopefully changed for the better. Thank you.
Father who art in heaven. Sia santificato il tuo nome. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Liberici dal male. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 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 same blessing every week here at Sundays at 6, and so I invite you to pray with me. The words are found on the screen. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Thank you for being here with us whenever it is you are watching. And we'll see you next Sunday at 6.